This rather odd and unexpected behavior of a rotating body is called the Janibekov effect. It's named after cosmonaut Vladimir Janibekov, who noticed the effect on a spinning wingnut while aboard the space station Salyut 7. What you're watching is a more recent NASA video demonstrating the Janibekov effect on a spinning T-handle. To see the Janibekov effect, we need a rigid body whose three principal axes of rotation have distinct moments of inertia. Here's an example of such a body. It consists of two large masses, colored cyan, and two small masses, colored red. The four masses are connected in a single plane at right angles with massless struts. This body, like all bodies, has three principal axes of rotation. When a body is rotated about one of its principal axes, the angular velocity and angular momentum point in the same direction. For this particular body, the principal axis with the largest moment of inertia is the axis perpendicular to the plane of the masses. Here we can see the body rotating about this axis, shown in yellow. I won't normally show this principal axis as part of the body. Note that this axis has the largest moment of inertia because each of the four masses is far from the axis of rotation. We can also rotate the body about the principal axis with the smallest moment of inertia, which coincides with the cyan-colored strut connecting the two larger masses. This axis has the smallest moment of inertia because only the small masses are extended away from the axis of rotation. The red strut, which connects the smaller masses, has the intermediate value of moment of inertia. The Janibekov effect occurs when we try to rotate the body about this intermediate axis. Now, it's been known for a long time, hundreds of years in fact, that rotation of a rigid body about its intermediate axis is unstable. This is known as the Intermediate Axis Theorem, also called the Tennis Racket Theorem. But the Intermediate Axis Theorem only tells us that rotation about the intermediate axis is unstable. It doesn't tell us anything about the long-term behavior of the body. As you can see, the long-term behavior is quite surprising. This is what we call the Janibekov effect. Recently, Derek Muller released a video on his YouTube channel, Veritasium, in which he explained the Janibekov effect based on an argument given by UCLA mathematician Terry Tao on math overflow. This is a fascinating video, but the explanation is incomplete. The argument for why rotation about the intermediate axis should be unstable can also be applied to the other two axes, which leads us to the conclusion that rotation about any axis should be unstable. Terry Tao addressed this shortcoming with an addendum to his original post. Now, I have no doubt that Professor Tao's extended explanation is technically correct, but personally I find his line of reasoning to be difficult to follow and not very intuitive. The problem I have with Professor Tao's explanation is that it requires you to imagine yourself in a frame of reference that is rotating about a direction in space that momentarily coincides with the angular velocity of the body, and then to consider the action of centrifugal and Coriolis forces on the body. I prefer to think about physics in terms of inertial frames where Newton's laws of motion hold and centrifugal and Coriolis forces are fictitious. More recently, Matt Parker released a video on his YouTube channel, Stand Up Maths, in which he discussed the Janibekov effect with Hugh Hunt, a Cambridge University engineer. Their explanation is essentially a repeat of the technical arguments found in any number of advanced classical mechanics books, such as Landau and Lifshitz or Goldstein. At the heart of the argument is a somewhat abstract mathematical analysis showing that the angular velocity vector of the body must follow the intersection of two ellipsoids. What I would like to present in this video is a fairly simple, intuitive explanation of the Janibekov effect. Let's return to the simple rigid body consisting of four masses in a plane. Remember, the red strut connecting the two small masses coincides with the principal axis that has the intermediate value of moment of inertia. This is the axis that's unstable, according to the intermediate axis theorem. If we begin the rotation precisely along this axis, the body will rotate uniformly, forever, as long as it's not perturbed. By the way, what you're watching is an actual simulation using the equations of Newtonian mechanics. It's not a cartoon animation. I'll discuss the equations of motion and the details of the simulation in an accompanying video. Also note that in these simulations, I always start the rotation in the inertial z direction, which points upward in these videos. Now let's tilt the intermediate axis away from the inertial z axis. 
The blue arrow is the angular momentum of the body. The yellow arrow is the angular velocity, which initially points upward in the z direction. As the simulation proceeds, you can see that the blue angular momentum vector stays constant. Of course, this is what we expect, since there are no torques on the body and angular momentum is conserved. In most of these simulations, I won't bother to show the angular momentum vector. On the other hand, the angular velocity vector, which initially pointed in the z direction, is not at all constant. The Jana Beckhoff effect is easily recognized when we begin the simulation with the red intermediate axis almost, but not exactly, aligned with the initial axis of rotation. Here, the initial angle between the intermediate axis, which is the red strut, and the initial axis of rotation, which is in the z direction, is about one-third of a degree. You can clearly see that the smaller masses, the red masses that begin near the positive and negative z axis, periodically switch places. Let's repeat this simulation. This time I'll turn off the angular velocity vector and add a trail to the red mass that begins near the positive z-axis. I'll also add a trail to one of the large cyan masses. You can see that the red mass periodically rotates down to the negative z-axis, then back up again, while the larger cyan mass continues to orbit close to the equatorial plane. This is the Jana Beckhoff effect. It's not difficult to understand intuitively if we imagine the cyan masses to be much larger than the red masses. Then the rotational motion of the body is determined primarily by the cyan masses. These larger masses will rotate approximately in a single plane, here the equatorial plane, and at an approximately constant angular velocity. Because the body is rigid, the red masses will be forced into motion about the z-axis along with the larger masses. As the body rotates, the red masses swing outward, away from the rotation axis, toward the equatorial plane. Their own inertia causes them to overshoot the equatorial plane. The two small masses then switch places and come nearly to rest with their positions reversed. The motion then repeats. I suspect many people will find it intuitively obvious that the small red masses should swing away from the initial axis of rotation and toward the equatorial plane. One way to describe this outward motion is to invoke the idea of a centrifugal force. Of course, the red masses are simply moving in accordance with Newton's laws, subject to the forces exerted on them by the struts. So let's put it this way. For the red masses to stay at the same angle with respect to the rotation axis, and not move away from the rotation axis and toward the equator, they would need to move in circles around the z-axis. This would require a radially inward force on each mass but the struts cannot exert a force that is perpendicular to the plane of the body. Now, this might not be immediately obvious. I claim that the forces exerted on the red masses by the struts must lie in the plane of the body. Here's why. By Newton's third law, the forces that the struts exert on the red masses are equal and opposite to the forces that the red masses exert on the struts. If these forces have a component perpendicular to the plane of the body, then the red masses will create a torque on the rest of the body. The rest of the body consists of the two struts and the large cyan masses. However, this arrangement of struts and masses has zero moment of inertia, and a non-zero torque would create an infinite angular acceleration. The conclusion is that the struts can't exert radially inward forces to keep the red masses moving in a circle. Therefore, each of the red masses will swing outward, away from the axis of rotation and towards the equator, due to its own inertia. Notice that this back and forth motion exhibited by the smaller red masses will occur for any initial angle between the red strut and the axis of rotation. Consider a large initial angle, say 80 degrees. In this case, the initial rotation axis, the z-axis, is almost aligned with the principal axis that has the largest moment of inertia. As the body spins, the red masses oscillate up and down, above and below the equatorial plane. You can see this most clearly if we change the viewing angle. Now you're looking down the y-axis toward the origin. This up and down motion of the small red masses is the same effect, the Jana Beckhoff effect, but with a small amplitude. 
Now, the interesting thing about this motion is that in the small amplitude limit, the frequency of the Jana Beckhoff oscillation is equal to the frequency of rotation. In other words, each red mass will oscillate up and down once as it rotates once around the z-axis. To be precise, this is only true in the limit of infinitely small oscillations. If we increase the speed of the rotation, it appears that the red masses move in a tilted plane that slowly processes. The plane processes because the up and down oscillation frequency is not exactly equal to the rotational frequency. As the initial angle between the red struts and the z-axis becomes smaller, the amplitude of the Chanabekoff oscillations become larger and the oscillation period becomes longer. For small initial angles, the Janabekoff oscillations are slow because the red masses tend to hang up near the poles. This motion of the red masses is physically and mathematically analogous to the motion of a pendulum. When the oscillations are small, the pendulum acts just like a simple harmonic oscillator with period independent of amplitude. But for larger amplitude oscillations, the period becomes larger. For very large amplitude motion, the pendulum bob hangs up near the unstable equilibrium position and the oscillation period becomes very large. So the Janabekoff effect occurs when the rotation axis, the z-axis in these videos, is initially near the intermediate principal axis. But these Janabekoff oscillations also occur when the rotation axis is initially near the principal axis with the largest moment of inertia then why do we say that rotation about the intermediate axis is unstable, but rotation about the axis with the largest moment of inertia is stable? What the intermediate axis theorem is actually telling us is whether or not the angular velocity vector remains close to a principal axis. Let's look at these simulations again, with the angular velocity vector shown as a yellow arrow. I've also added a yellow strut to represent the body axis with the largest moment of inertia. If the angular velocity vector and the intermediate axis, which is the red strut, are initially close, they will quickly separate away from one another as the red masses execute a large amplitude Janabekoff oscillation. If the angular velocity vector is initially close to the axis with the largest moment of inertia, they will stay close to one another as the red masses execute a small amplitude Janabekoff oscillation. What about the principal axis with the smallest moment of inertia? This is an interesting case. The intermediate axis theorem tells us that motion about this axis with the cyan color is stable, so the angular velocity should stay close to the principal axis as the motion proceeds. You can see from this simulation that, while this is certainly true, the principal axis and the angular velocity vector do stay close to one another. They are not at all fixed in the inertial frame. Recall that the motion of the body as a whole tends to be dominated by the larger masses. So if these masses are moving initially, they tend to keep moving. In fact, in the limit in which the smaller masses are insignificant, the larger masses would move in great circles about the origin. So there you have it. The Janabekoff effect explained in words, with no equations, in a way that I hope you'll find intuitive. If you'd like to see the mathematics behind these simulations, keep a lookout for my next video. There, I'll derive the equations of motion in detail, starting from the action principle for the four masses connected by struts.